I'm ready. Uh, welcome to the April 20th, 2016. I think I'll start over since there's a lot of commotion here. Okay, welcome to the April 20th, 2016 meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. Please rise and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mrs. Zambrano, can you please call the roll? Commissioner Simpson? Here. Commissioner Gregory? Here. Vice Chair Reeder? Here. And Chair McMahon? Here. Any person who wishes to speak regarding an item on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction during the public comments portion of the agenda must file a purple speaker card with the recording secretary before the portion of the agenda is called. Any person wishing to speak on a specific agenda item must file a public speaker card before the specific item is called. Persons addressing the Traffic Commission are requested to state their name and city of residence for the record. Under state law, issues presented or introduced under public comments can have no action and will be referred to the Traffic Engineering Division Manager for administrative action or to be scheduled on a subsequent agenda. It would be appreciated if you'd silence all cell phones during the meeting. Also, as TOTV can only record your comments while speaking into the microphone, there should not be any dialogue between the audience and the commissioners unless you're at the podium. If you're unable to come to the podium or should you need to step away from the podium while speaking, a wireless microphone is available for your convenience. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so let's see. Um, each public comment speaker will be given three minutes. The recording secretary will set the timer accordingly. When the yellow card is displayed, you will have one minute left, so please begin wrapping up at that time. The red card indicates your time is up, so please stop speaking, but remain at the podium until questions, if any, from the commissioners have been answered. Okay, so. Right. Um, Where's my agenda? Okay. So first, um, we have an agenda, uh, accommodation for our outgoing commissioner, Andrew Pletcher. He has just been appointed to the Planning Commission. So um, let's see. I, I guess we do it from here. And the accommodation says, whereas Andrew Pletcher was appointed to the Thousand Oaks Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission in April 2015, serving until April 2016, and whereas Andrew has generously volunteered his time to serve the City of Thousand Oaks as Traffic Commissioner and has provided invaluable input on traffic-related issues, including green bike lanes, bicycle safety, flashing yellow arrow traffic signals, residential street traffic calming measures, resolving speeding concerns, road restriping improvements, pedestrian access and safety, stop sign installations, and crossing guard programs. And whereas Andrew's contributions as commissioner of this city's Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission have proven to be an invaluable resource in the city's decision-making process, and whereas Andrew Pletcher has provided exemplary service to our community while serving them on the Thousand Oaks Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. Now, therefore, I, Joel R. Price, Mayor of the City of Thousand Oaks, on behalf of the entire City Council, commend Andrew Fletcher for his dedication and contributions over the past year in the enhancement of our community. So, there we go. Thank you. <coughs> Yes, so I will call you first for public comments, um, but before I do, are there any comments from the commissioners? 
Well, it seems like she just got here, and uh, now off you go. But uh, at least you have had uh, the experience of what it's like to be on the traffic commission. So as you go through your planning uh, activities, uh, you'll know not to hand off any problems to us if you can. So <laughs> appreciate it. You've been great on the commission. Glad to have you. Yeah, I just want to thank you for your time. As uh, as we all do, you know, it is a little bit of homework to come here and read everything and go to the sites, you know, that we're supposed to uh, review and make recommendations. We don't do that blindly. So it is a personal sacrifice. And we all have favorite sports teams, too, that always run on our commission night that we give up to. But over time, that adds up. But uh, I appreciate all the time you've given up and, and the good job you've done. I'm really um, excited that you're going to be taking on an expanded role within the city of Thousand Oaks. And as far as time goes, I think it's really commemorable that as a young parent and working father that you're willing to spend two nights a month dedicated to the city be above and beyond, you know, all the pre-work that you're going to have to do. So I'm really happy. And I know that with your um, dedication to the city that you're going to do a fabulous job representing the needs of all the citizens. I, I want to echo everyone else's comments. Um, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure serving with you. And now we will do public comments, and you're first. So please state your name and city of residence for the uh, record. My name is uh, Andrew Pletcher. I'm uh, Westlake Village, Thousand Oaks uh, area. Um, I just wanted to also uh, take a moment to thank each member of the commission for uh, an enjoyable time. Uh, we worked hard on a lot of great issues, including uh, input on the Westlake Village sidewalk project and, of course, the flashing yellow lights. I'm very excited to see those go up over the next year. Um, I think we do a lot. We do a lot of great things here, and I think you know we're the first step in um, listening to. Anybody who walks through that door and has something to say about the traffic in Thousand Oaks. And what's really impressed me is that each idea and each comment that we get from the public, we can take to our wonderful city staff and they respond and they get back to uh, each person. And I think that says something because I know a lot of cities that, that don't where the government just, it, you know, the, their local government just doesn't listen. Uh, but it, it truly is a testament to how well we listen and try to accommodate and change and update our roads and traffic and improve the flow um, you know it's a it's it's something to be said about our city staff so I want to of course thank our city staff as well um, and I just wanted to offer just a bit of encouragement over the next year um, there's still certainly a lot of great work left to do uh, the Lynn Road and the safety group that's that's popped up with regard to Lynn Road. It's, it's certainly an issue. It's certainly a problem that needs to be addressed. I think there's certainly practical measures that can be done to slow down traffic, including an increased police presence and um, just really putting the focus in because Lynn Road, the problem isn't going to go away, especially with the compound now being built for the Rams at CLU. It's something that, in my mind, is only going to get uh, more of a problem, but we have, I know we have a lot of, we have great commissioners that are going to bring practical, smart ideas that not only will save the city money, but, you know, listen and solve the problem along Lynn Road. But uh, again, thank you very much, commissioners. Thank you, city staff. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we do have another um, public comment speaker. Marshall Denninger, please um, state your name and city of residence for the record. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Marshall Denninger. I've lived in the Canal Valley for 28 years, the last 17 in Newberry Park. I'm here tonight to um, introduce the grassroots efforts started by Newberry Park residents that live and drive along Lynn Road from the 101 North to Via Las Brisas and Dos Vientos and Thanks for the shout out there. On February 11th, another horrible accident at Lynn and Greendale Avenue, if, um, excuse me, on February 11th, after another horrible accident at Lynn and Greendale Avenue, a Facebook community page was created to bring together concerned neighbors who want to improve the unsafe conditions of Lynn Road. Within five days, we had over 120 members, and now we're at a ho over 190. 
I think that this immediate participation speaks to the public's frustrations and concern about the safety of Lynn Road. It seems everyone has witnessed, or even worse, has a personal experience of a crash or a near miss. Our goal is to build a community of neighbors that can work with the city to help drive change to improve the unsafe conditions that exist. We look to do this in a collaborative and respectful manner. To that end, we've held a meeting in the field with Mr. Fatimi, and I apologize if I pronounce anybody's names not wrong, Mr. Mashiko, Ms. Lowry, Mrs. Simpson, Officer Clifton, and several concerned citizens. I felt the meeting was an excellent start to our effort. Public Works was very responsive to the meeting request and uh, open to the discussions that we had. Some of what was discussed was how does the city approach the issue? Do they look at the entire stretch all at once, intersection by intersection, and what's the solution? Lowering the speed limit, more stop signs, less stop signs, more law enforcement, permanent early warning signals. It became clear that there was no one size fits all solution for this stretch of Lynn Road. It was also suggested that the entire stretch of Lynn Road may be too much to bite off all at once. I was asked and agreed to reach out to the community to gather some information that would help identify some of the worst areas on Lynn and what the issues are and provide suggestions of what the community would like to see done. To do this, I created an online survey with two questions. Number one, in your opinion, rank, rank the three most dangerous Lynn Road intersections that should be investigated to pr improve their overall safety. And all the intersections were listed and the participants could select up to three. Second question, from these options stack rank what would help be, what could be done to help improve the conditions? Current speed limit, quantity of stoplights, locations and quantities or of other permanent early warning indicators or other, and participants would enter their own ideas. The survey closed last night, so I'll compile and, uh, and share with uh, Mr. Mashiko. Uh, 96 in, in the next couple days, 96 people participated in the survey. And as you can imagine, the opinions and the ideas were plentiful and broad. Uh, but there was a consistent message that came through, and it came through loud and clear. Lynn Road's not safe, and uh, we're scared for ourselves and our families that must use it. Since the creation of our group in February, there have been no less than four serious accidents along Lynn Road. The last one was just two days ago. The accident that started this effort happened at an intersection in my neighborhood exactly where I have personally witnessed two vehicles slam through the back block, backyard block wall and into my neighbor's yard. This neighbor cited that those accidents was a major reason she moved out of our neighborhood. Now that house has two young children living there who are not allowed to play in their backyard for fear of another vehicle crashing through the wall. Our group is looking to this committee and our city representatives to help improve the safety of, safety of our community, and we look forward to working with you to make it happen. I would like to request that this committee put our concern of the unsafe conditions of Lynn Road on the next meeting agenda and to begin developing a plan to address them. It's clear that something must change along the stretch of road, something that is sustainable and something that will ultimately lessen the likelihood that someone will be killed pulling out of their neighborhood, crossing the street, or even just playing in their backyard. Oh, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions of the speaker? Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, so that was item number five, public comments. <coughs> item number six, summary notes of February 17th. Uh, were there any comments on those or questions? Okay. Um, item number seven, engineer reports. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Mishiko. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Chair McMahon, uh, this item is here to consider whether or not there's sufficient public support to restripe Green Meadow Drive um, east of Lynn Road to resolve resident traffic concerns. We have a PowerPoint presentation off to the side. And um, uh, the slide here shows the uh, location map that shows the quarter mile segment of Green Meadow Drive that we're considering this, this evening. Uh, the segment is... Okay, yes, here's the location map that shows the quarter mile segment of Green Meadow Drive shown in blue. It's uh, east of Lynn Road, just south of the 101 freeway. Uh, 
Kenwood Street is the uh, 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 road that bisects Green Meadow Drive. To the east of this segment is the area fronted by single-family homes, and just to the west is the segment fronted by multi-unit uh, uh, condominiums and townhomes. Um, I'm going to be showing you a series of uh, photographs of Green Meadow Drive as it exists today. Uh, this first photo is looking to the west towards Lynn Road. Uh, you can see that there's a traffic signal there at uh, the Lynn Road Green Meadow intersection. Um, the road is uh, fairly wide at 64 feet curb to curb. And you see that there's a center line stripe separating the eastbound and westbound traffic. So there's uh, ample room for uh, vehicular traffic, bikes, and parked vehicles. Uh, this next photo is looking towards the east, and it's taken near Kenwood Street, where the center line ends. As I mentioned earlier, Kenwood uh, is the midpoint of Green Meadow Drive. This next photo is looking um, further to the east, um, where the area is fronted by single-family homes, and there's no uh, markings along the road here. And this last photo shows the uh, easterly end of the street. Uh, we're off to the left side. There's a uh, driveway entrance to the Cameron Center, which is a uh, uh, city facility that hosts a number of uh, activities and events from time to time. And then just off to the right is the entrance and exit to the Green Meadow bike path. Uh, the primary complaints that we've received from residents uh, mainly come from the east end of the street, and they center around speeding, uh, poor driving behavior of uh, cars that are within the 30-foot wide travel lanes and conflicts that occur at the east end of the street. Now later this summer uh, the city will be resurfacing Green Meadow Drive so this uh, presents an opportunity where the city can implement a change, a new striping pattern and this schematic shows you how we can take that 64-foot curb-to-curb section and create separate areas for park vehicles, uh, bikes, uh, the the uh, vehicular traffic in a center two-way turn lane. And here's a photograph showing an example of this type of striping. We refer to it as a traffic calming striping. It's on Hillcrest Drive between 20 the 23 Freeway and Hoden Camp Road. And here on this segment of Hillcrest, the road width is uh, the same as Hoden Camp or the same as Green Meadow. Uh, the benefits of this type of striping is that uh, it reduces rear end conflicts. Uh, improves visibility f at driveways and cross streets, and improves safety for cyclists. Uh, we've had a number of successes with this type of striping and calming traffic on other streets in the city. Here's just a listing of, of those streets. And when we implemented uh, the striping change to these streets, the residents who front the road um, uh, uh, appreciated the, the changes, uh, for the, the positive changes that came with it. Uh, as the striping um, achieve the anticipated benefits. Although um, I pointed out there's some advantages to this striping, for Green Meadow Drive, this type of striping um, has a couple of disadvantages. Uh, number one is that the aesthetic impact to the neighborhood because of the new signage and striping that would be added, and also the fact that um, the signage and, uh, or the striping could give the appearance that uh, Green Meadow is a through street from Lynn to Moore Park Road. So the staff recommendation is in the report. If there's public support in addition to support of the commission uh, for the striping proposal, the striping would be implemented this summer. And we would uh, bring a uh, status report back on the traffic, condi traffic conditions in the spring of 2017. However, if it's not apparent that the uh, residents support this proposal and it's not supported by the commission, we would discontinue this, uh, this striping concept. So with that, this concludes this presentation, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions of Mr. Vesiti? Okay. Yeah. Um, you're proposing to do this at this time because, what, that stretch of road is going to get a slurry coat, and you have to restripe it? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. When um, the contractor, when they finish uh, resurfacing the road, they do have to come back in with uh, restriping what's there today. Uh, however, if we, you know, uh, if there's a recommendation by the commission and there's support by the residents, we can have all this work completed at the same time instead of at a, at a later time as a separate city project. 
So that's so we don't do a striping and then need to do a calming method later. Is this going to cost a lot more than normal striping, or is it pretty much apples to apples? Yeah, it, it's probably more cost effective if you make it all as part of the the same project where the striping crew is going to be out there anyway, and w you you would implement just something different that's uh, versus what's in there today. Uh, we estimated the the additional cost of this type of striping would be about uh, ten thousand dollars for thermoplastic material, or if it's with uh, using paint, the cost would would be about five thousand dollars. Okay. Um, do we know if there's any overflow parking down that street from the center at the end? I, I drove it today, and I, <laughs> I didn't honestly see a single parked car on that street. It seemed pretty quiet. It's basically what it was. So uh, I know there's busy, you know, times, and I know on the weekends bicyclists use that that trail, and I didn't have the time to observe that, but. Um, I didn't know if you do you know if there's parking on that street a lot or well we we've driven that street uh, a number of times and it's during the day so um, you know we didn't see that there was a quite a you know a lot of cars where it was bumper to bumper condition we just probably saw what what you saw today it was just sporadic parking here and there uh, I imagine there may be more parking on weekends or when there's an event at the Cameron Center uh, there is um, on-site parking at the Cameron Center, so perhaps if there's a, a large crowd, it would then spill out into uh, Green Meadow Drive. All right. Uh, do we know how many bicyclists use that route at all? Do we have any data on that? Or I'm just looking for conflicts because, I mean, I like the concept of the striping, but it seemed kind of like a quiet little street, to tell you the truth, <laughs> when I drove it. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have any um, data on, on bicycle uh, okay. counts. We just have it on the All vehicular right. traffic. All right. I'll, I'll wait for public comment for anything else. I had a couple questions. In your report, you said um, there were conflicts at, at the east end by the Cameron Center and the bike path. Um, I didn't understand what you meant by conflicts. What? Well, at the uh, Cameron Center um, and then at where the um, uh, bike path at the very end of the road, there's really no mar uh, markings on the road to guide uh, vehicles who say you want to make a left turn into Cameron Center. You just basically make a, a, a turn in, uh, but at the same time there could be a, um, a cyclist coming out of the Green Meadow bike path, and you know that that's a conflict point right there because the, the driveway into Cameron Center is right at the ingress egress point where the bike path begins. I've ridden so. my bike there many times, um, so I know it well. Um, do you have a count how many vehicles per day? Yeah, we took uh, traffic counts uh, right up near l the Lynn Road intersection, and we found that the volume of traffic is uh, just under uh, 4,000 vehicles per day, 2,000 in each direction. And then we took another count at the um, towards the end of the street, and the volume there is less than a hundred vehicles per day. And is there a certain t number that you look for when you do a, a striping project like this? Well, the uh, uh, we well in the past, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Avenida de los Arbolos, we looked at sort of the upper threshold at which. Uh, this type of striping where it would exceed uh, capacity. The, um, you know, for this type of volume on the road, uh, less than 4,000 vehicles per day, it's, it's um, uh, you know, sufficient. Uh, you wouldn't want to put this type of striping in where the volume exceeds 20,000 vehicles per day. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no real minimum. There's no real minimum. Okay, that was, that was my question. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, then we will have um, comments. Um, let's see. So we have blue, uh, purple speaker cards, or if you don't want to speak but you want your thoughts known, there are blue, uh, blue cards. You can fill them out and bring them to our secretary. Um, the f first speaker is Don Fisher. Um, state your name for the record and your city of residence. And you have five minutes. I don't have any notes prepared, by the way, so I just brought the letter with me. 
Uh, Don Fisher, uh, Newbury Park, Thousand Oaks, 253 Grand Meadow. Um, thanks for uh, uh, having me speak today here. When I first received this letter in the mail, I was kind of confused because um, I actually pushed it, put it aside, and Linda actually called me up and said, uh, did you get this letter in the mail? And I'm like, um, I, I, I thought it was a mistake because I saw this picture, and I'm like, there, there's no way they would stripe our street. Like the, the gentleman Tom right here said that, you know, it's a nice, quiet street. I've lived there for nine years. And I don't know why that would be a solution to stripe the street. And um, I don't know if we're addressing the, the real concern here. I've lived there for nine years, and it's been relatively quiet. You have people in the neighborhood that are going to speed, of course. But the Cameron Center at the end of that block is the problem. Two days ago, I was watering my roses. Some guy came out of the Cameron Center in his new Tesla and literally was going 75 miles an hour. And he almost ran. I mean, there, there's kids playing on that street. So I don't know what happened with the Cameron Center. I think it's been open for a school um, two times a, a week. So I think that needs to be addressed because I don't know if that's zoned for a school I don't know if it's been made for school. I can understand, and I get worked up because of this. I mean, I love this community, so. Um, I don't know if striping the street is the answer to the question. The, the issue is the Cameron Center, and I believe Francesca actually lives. She has complaints about people speeding on that road behind the Cameron Center because those people don't live in our community. They don't live in that neighborhood, so they don't really care. They don't know that there's little kids living on that street. That that guy yesterday, two days ago, was lit easily going 70 miles an hour coming out of the Cameron Center. So I don't know the events that are being held at that Cameron Center, but that's what you really need to look at because before those changes were made with those new activities, these speeding problems were not really that evident. I don't know if if the the engineer is aware of that but um up until that I've, like i said i've lived here for nine years and you know you're, you're going to get some people speeding here and there but um i don't really know what the striping is actually going to do and to the aesthetic point i don't know property value i don't i'm not you know things like that but i don't really think that the striping is going to be the solution for that so thanks are there any questions of our speaker Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I do have one. Uh, y you mentioned that uh, kids play on that street? They do. There's a new family that actually moved in about, what, say, two years ago. Uh, there's two young child, and then there's a, a young baby, too. So they do play on that street. And then next door. And, yeah, we have brand new people that just moved in that, right. yes. Uh, I would just encourage you to go over and look at some of the other areas that we've done the striping. Yeah. Because it does increase the safety borders on the edges. Okay. Uh, we had, you know, an issue on Hillcrest, and when we put it in, th there were rear-end collisions, people trying to go around cars, that type of thing. But you've got a designated parking lane, all right, that other on, other than park cars, only people are supposed to be there, yeah. and then a designated bike, which gives quite a buffer between where the cars are. So, uh, I think what staff might have been thinking is, is if there is anything, and, yeah. and as you've noted, yeah, you know, we can't change the behavior of drivers, or, you know, other than their impression that if it's a big wide avenue, you know, you tend to want to speed because you feel safe. When you narrow and restrict that, uh, people mm -hmm. tend to slow down more, right? As evidenced with the uh, uh, Avenida de los Arbolos, you know, we, we heard all the stories there. I, I take that all the time. And, yeah. and everybody just drives the speed limit and gets there, and we don't have to do as much. So um, your feedback is, you know, welcome. I think we need to check into some of the things that you said. Thank you. So. But uh, what we're trying to do here is increase the safety on the streets, yes, okay, and yes. and affect somewhat people's perception of being able to speed yeah. on it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I will agree with him that if there are lines and you have a narrow, uh, the perception of a narrower place to drive, 
you do tend to go slower and i think that's okay. that was part of the the whole idea okay. so um thank you are there any other questions of our speaker okay yes. um next we have marilyn novak um please state your name and city of residence for the record do I get to use the low one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Marilyn Novak. Um, I've lived in that area for 33 years. And um, if you saw a speeding car, I'm really amazed because <clears throat> I walk my dog there every single day at a different time, sometimes in the morning, sometimes late afternoon. I've never seen anyone speeding. I have to come out. Uh, my my uh, townhouse is up on the hill. So we don't have direct access to Green Meadow. We come either um, off of Springwood or off of Kenwood. And when I was going to work every day, the longest that the line ever was there was five cars. So I didn't think that a left turn you know, was a problem. Um, the Cameron Center is, you have to make a hard left to get into the Cameron Center and you have to make a very hard right to get out of the Cameron Center. It's just like a corner. And so I, I've seen lots of traffic, but I've never seen anyone speeding, and I frequently walk my dog down that, that street. There's a way to get in there, either through the gate being open or, or not um, having the gate open, and people have gone very slowly seeing me there walking my dog. So that's my, that's my personal opinion on that. Um, there are 16 houses, this, this street is, is two blocks long. There are 16 houses on that street, that's, that's all. Um, and then there are three gated entries onto Green Meadow, which means if they're gated, you don't have a whole parade of cars coming in onto Green Meadow at any time because probably the most that can get through with one gate opening is two. So you don't have that much. And then you have cars coming from, from Kenwood. And again, they have to make hard turns to get onto Green Meadow. So I've, I've really never seen speeding there. In all the years I've lived there, one night I heard the squealing of tires went down the next morning and there were black marks that somebody had been doing some donuts one time in 33 years. Um, I, I just don't think that it's that busy, that it requires all that striping. Um, there are a lot of our, you know, I'm very conscious of our condos. We have some up on the hill, so they look down on that, on that road. Seeing all those lines in bright yellow and bright white is a real eyesore. There are also two-story houses that face Green Meadow from both sides, and they would have the same thing as opposed to one center line. When you talk about the problem of bikes, and since you, you uh, ride that bike trail, then you know. So you have the bike line, which is going this way as they're going up. If they're coming off the hill, that's when the cyclists are speeding, because they're coming down a hill. If somebody is going to turn into Cameron, there's no way to stripe that to prevent that from being a problem because the bicyclists just shoot over that hill and they come down. They have to cross over where the cars are turning to go into the Cameron Center. So you can't, you can't stripe around that problem. The bikes going in, they're on the right. So if the cars are turning to the left, then there's, then there's no conflict. Um, the fastest I've seen on that street really is the bis bicyclists. And the kids that play that moved in two years ago, I didn't know that two more moved in. That's a little scary. They run out in the street. They ride their, their little, they ride their little bikes and they ride directly across that street. They're not going to care about lines. They also play in this, their, that house is on the corner of Kenwood and Green Meadow. So the kids play on the side also. So to, to go through all this, to spend that much money, I talked to Jim this morning and asked him to come up with the, with the funding to sort of spend $10,000 to do that much striping, to create that much of an eyesore on that street, I don't think is going to solve any of the problems that are there, and I don't think there are that many there. You've got a stoplight and a dead end and two blocks in, in between and 16 houses. Mm -hmm. 
with driveways. So I, I just don't see the, the reason for spending the city money on doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of our speaker? Okay. Yeah, I, I do, oh. actually. Yeah, you, you observed the kids driving there. I mean, they play in that street like oh, yeah. it's just. Oh, yeah. Okay. They run out in it. They had hoverboards for a while. Right. Those kind of disappeared, so I don't know if that was the safety issue of the hoverboards, but they have small bikes. They ride each other. You know, on, right. on the on the back, and they're they're it, it's pretty scary are, because are they I pretty savvy kids. Do they mm -mm. watch for traffic, or mm -mm. Are they just out there playing? No, because I've I've walked. Um, they live on the oh dear, the north side of Green Meadow. So I'm coming down on the on the south side of Kenwood, and I turn the corner and stay on that same side of the street to walk my dog. And um, they've ridden their bikes. Or, across the street to say hi and pet the dog yeah it's been my observant that kids are fearless but we all grew up and somehow survived it but that's <coughs> because we were taught to look for cars yeah that, that and, and if that, a car came the first person saw it yelled car and we all stopped and right. went to the side my big concern and i've sat here and told other people that whether a car is going 50 miles an hour or five the child always loses so if you're not educating your child on where to play safely, a street is never that place unless you're really confident those kids, you know, are savvy kids that really take a look. And I don't find that to be true in today's generation. And, I mean, and, kids don't watch for anything. No, and, <laughs> and I cross that street in many, in many different places. Depend, I have all my different timing so I know how long each one of my walks is going to take, but I do have to cross that street, and I never have a problem because I watch for cars. The dog right. sits until it's clear, and then we heal and go across. So, you know, if I never have a problem crossing that street with a, with a dog, then a child watching for traffic wouldn't, wouldn't either, but I don't think that kind of striping is, is so, going to So help. if I look at this problem from all directions, okay, and I say, okay, kids play out in there, but if I have lanes designated that clearly more defines that these are places cars should be, it's not a big asphalt parking lot that you can play on, do you think that would modify their behavior? No. I'm sorry, but I, but I don't. Ever since ever, ever since those kids have moved in, well, they treated that save whole people, intersection. We're here to save people, not right. inconvenience. I'm sorry. We're to, yeah. we, we can't have comments okay. from the audience. Yeah, so. Ever since those kids have moved in, I've been very aware of right. the fact that they've treated that whole area because it's, because it's wide and there aren't very many cars there as right. a playground. Are there any uh, conflicts that you've noticed with bicyclists? You say they come down there fairly quick. They can I mean, they have a right to be on the road, so, you know, you have to look at them just like a vehicle. Right. And, and they do come hauling off that hill pretty quickly. But another issue that we have with the bicyclists is that if they want to turn left on Lynn Road, they're coming down Green, Green Meadow. They're on the right. They have to cross over two lanes. The, the right lane, the straight lane, to get into the left turn lane. So changing the striping is not going to help that for the cyclists either, if that's what they're doing. And, and my observation has always been that every, everybody that is on that road a lot is very aware of what they have to do and does it, and does it pretty carefully. Okay, that's all good feedback, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, um, next is Linda Ben Young. And please state your name and re uh, city of re residence. Yeah, my name's Linda Ben Young. Um, I live at 266 Green Meadow Drive, Newbury Park. Um, I l have lived in that house for 25 years. Um, I front Green Meadow. I live, uh, I'm the last house on the left hand side that actually fronts Green Meadow. Everything that everybody has said so far is absolutely correct. There is no problem. There was never a problem until the Cameron Center business got started with all of them renting it for this, for that. I don't know that this is the place to talk about that. I think that's a park and rec problem, but that's really what it is. And the aesthetics, uh, I agree, are, are going to be quite unattractive. Um, you have people coming off of 
Lynn Road where they're going, right? 60, 65. Then now they're going to turn down our street, and I'm not sure, yes, you have that, like, oh, it's big and open, and it's, it's nice, and that makes them go fast, but also coming off a of Lynn now onto a street that looks like it goes all the way through, that has all this striping, and they're thinking, yeah, this is like Hillcrest, and I can really move here. So I'm not sure which one's going to happen, but it's, I really would prefer not to have the striping. I don't think it's going to help um, at all. Um, and the speeding is not at any other part so much. It's about from Don's house to Francesca. So it's maybe four houses from the Cameron Center Street. That's really where the majority of the problem lies. It wasn't designed to have bikes coming down, cars turning into Green Meadow. Green Meadow, it used to be used, uh, the Cameron Center was used for the election for voting and maybe one or two other community events and then it turned into wh what's happening here there's another there's another car there's another car. what is happening and they just race up and down the street they really really do and they don't live there they're not from the community um francesca's worked really hard mr mashiko's really worked with us we we got the stop sign put in we got speed limit signs remember we went the whole speed limit we got that the striping I don't think is going to help. I think enforcement would really help enormously and figuring out if there's something we can do for the people to enter the Cameron Center in a safer manner, and I don't know what the heck that is. Because, it, like I said, it wasn't designed for the kind of traffic that's going in and out of there at this stage of the game. So uh, we've talked about possibly talking to Park and Rec, talking to the city council, to talk about the amount of traffic going in and out of the Cameron Center. Um, but, you know, we love our street. Our neighbors are great. We all know each other. And it, it really is a nice, quiet street. I totally agree, except for that, except for the traffic. And it's dangerous for the bikes. As you know, when you come down that hill, you're coming at a pretty good speed because it's a pretty good hill. So the bikes are coming down, especially the guys that race, you know, with the, the things on their clothes. And, they're, and they are cooking. And people come out of the little Cameron Center street, they walk their dogs. I mean, I do it too. And we come out of there, and it's like, is there a bike coming? It's terrifying. Um, and also, if someone's coming out of the Cameron Center, we had a stop sign put there, but hardly anybody stops. And so the bike coming down the hill now conflicts with the people coming out of the Cameron Center, and they can't see. It's a completely blind to them to see the bikers coming down. So yeah, it's a, it's a really dangerous little section in a community that there's lots of dog people walking dogs and kids riding their bikes. Aside from the kids you were talking about before, um, yeah, it's it's a nice nice street. Even though it's wide, it's um, I just I don't think the striping is is what we want on that street. So, and if you have any suggestions on what we can do for that little camera and center issue, that would be awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions of this speaker? Well, I, w I would like to know if you thought a sign um, just reminding drivers while exiting the Cameron Center would be a practical, low-cost solution, something just to note the neighborhood surroundings, because that's... Yeah. You know, n nothing would hurt, but we, Francesca, she, well, she lives right on the corner, but, so she got us all to kind of put up signs that said, you know, drive safely, you know, as though your kids live here, your pets live here and stuff, so we all kind of put them up, and we, we even went down there for a while and put little notes on their cars to, you know, that came every week to, could, would you, you know, please slow down, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't seem to be very effective. I really think enforcement, that was what we were thinking when we got the speed limit, which took quite a while to get um, and like I said Jim was really helpful with that we got the speed limit signs up but th we can't seem to get much enforcement there and it's not like I want them handing out humongous tickets but just a little more presence there warning people and then once one or two of the people get a ticket and they tell all their friends they got a ticket I think that'll make a big difference because a lot of them are the same people and whoever is using it and renting it it's there's like um, homeschooling school and there's some other things going on in there okay thank you very much mm -hmm. Um, all right. That. Next, we have Karen Robinson. Um, please state your name and city of residence. Um, this is kind of last minute. I think we got this on Monday. Um, my first inclination is the stripes not only are not attractive, 
they, um, I don't see that they'll be effective. I mean, we, I just heard somebody talk about Lynn Road that has stripes and people go 70 miles there easily. And I agree with my neighbors that the issue is really the Cameron Center. So it feels like, you know, as far as having you know, places for people to park, I don't think we have a parking issue. You know, that everybody, park, you know, 4th of July we have a parking issue, but that's about it. Because um, the Cameron Center has their own parking, but it's them getting to their parking and leaving. That's a problem. Um, for me personally, I walk my dog, I see the cyclists. That's, I can manage that. I feel like they generally can manage that, but the cars are a far greater concern, you know, I think probably to cyclists and to dog walkers and runners. Um, I, when I talked to Linda, I was like, I, I don't know what the rule is about the Cameron Center, about, because I've lived there eight years. In the beginning, I didn't even know it was there. They're like, oh, the Cameron Center. I have no idea what that even is. But it is f used, f you know, quite a bit more now. I don't know if those groups can um, be responsible for hiring off-duty police officers to control their traffic. Um, and again, I'm happy to hear whatever you know anybody has to suggest. But for me personally, I can't see that the the striping seems like it would be beneficial for us. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. Um, and our last speaker card is Francesca Puccio. <clears throat> My name is Francesca Puccio. I live at 282 Yellowstone Drive actually Avenue in Thousand Oaks. My house is at the end of Green Meadow Drive. It backs up to the Cameron Center. And I have, out of everybody in the neighborhood, the biggest issue in the entire neighborhood about the people racing up the street. When they, they get to about Dawn's house, they, they start to go pretty fast. On Mondays, we have a home school. We've had it for probably about four or five years now. About four or five years ago, the, the city decided that they were going to rent it out Monday through Friday for a uh, summer camp. So we have, on an average, because I've gone out and counted, they have two sessions in the morning for, for two different groups of kids and then two sessions in the afternoon. So you've got, I would say on an average, 150 to 200 car trips per day, Monday through Friday from 9 in the morning till 4 p.m. in the afternoon. These are moms that want to drop their kids off, so they race up there. Linda and I have been out with our dogs talking in the street and almost gotten run over. I started this with Jim Mashiko probably five or six years ago, and he's, like I say, like Linda said, he's been kind enough. We've had signs put up. However, the signs for, are for a 30-mile-hour uh, speed limit down at the bottom of the hill. Down as, as you make a left turn. Nobody, nobody pays any attention to it. I'm all for doing something about the Cameron Center, basically, and that has been my biggest complaint. I cannot go in my backyard anymore on a Saturday because there's a religious group that uses it. And sometimes, yes, there is an overflow, and they park next to my house or in front of my house. We have had issues with meetings down there. There's only about 32 spaces at the Cameron Center. So what happens is when they can't park down there, they're in our neighborhood. And I have to say they're a very disrespectful people. And I think that, I know that's my biggest issue. When I moved into the house 11 years ago, the Cameron Center was used on a Sunday for a religious group, and it was used on a Tuesday for another group, and once in a while for a party or a meeting. That was it. We do live in a nice, quiet neighborhood, but I feel over the past five or six years since they've introduced the school and the, and the other um, entities that they have in there, like the, the religious group, the religious group is in and out, in and out, all day long on a Saturday. I can't go sit out in my backyard, and I would bet that they're, they're going 40 or 50 miles an hour behind my house, and they have no respect for anybody. And I'm, I'm responsible for, for bringing this all to fruition here, and I appreciate it. I've talked to Jim Mashiko quite a few times about coming up with some type of resolve. When you put the, 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 the counters out there, you put them out on a Tuesday. I can tell you there's 10 women that go down to the Cameron Center on Tuesday because they go for an a overweight women's group. The days to be down there to take a look and see what's going on really is on a, two, on, is on a Monday morning from 9 o'clock in the morning until about 2 or 3 in the afternoon when the moms are dropping the kids off because it's one in and one out. And then during the summertime and then on Saturdays, we, it's just 
like like I said, it, it it scares me even to go out and walk my dogs anymore. My neighbors across the street, I know I've had three neighbors complain to me that there are days they don't feel comfortable pulling out of their own driveways because they have to back out. You guys aren't in that, that part of the neighborhood. They have to pull out, and they're afraid that they're going to get hit either by somebody coming down the hill doing 40 or 50 on their bike or someone zipping out of the Cameron Center. We have another issue on that on that street too. Like I say, at, at my end of the street, it's the worst. We have kids that come up there and they do Brodies at the end of the street, and I don't know if striping is going to help any of this. But I'm here tonight because I'm sick and tired of the of the traffic going in and out of the Cameron Center. We're getting two, you know, we're getting thousands of cars that nobody knows about. And I hope that this this will at least bring it to not only the traffic commission's attention, but perhaps to the city, because I've talked to everybody I can possibly talk to at the city, at the Cameron Center, Parks and Recs, and I kind of get one of these, like, so what? Well, you know what? I want to enjoy my home, and you, and, and not you personally, but the city has taken away my quiet enjoyment. I can't even go out and sit because I've got, I, I feel like I'm living on Lynn Road now instead of at the end of Green Meadow where it should end. So anyway, I thank you very much and I want to thank Jim Mashiko. I did email Jim Mashiko a couple of other ideas. I lived in another neighborhood in Calabasas where they actually put in traffic calming devices that were innovative. They're, they're, uh, I think they're called chokers and I did send him pictures of them. If anybody is interested, I'd be more than happy to email them to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we, yes. we have a question. So just for clarification, yes. because whenever I talk to neighbors, you know, one says, I've never seen anybody speed, and somebody else says, I see them speed there all the time. <laughs> and I go, you sure you live on the same street? Mm -hmm. So we get a little confused when we hear conflicting stuff. Okay. okay? If, if, if the striping method calms your street down, or has an advantage to that, are you for it or not? I would be for anything that would do it. I'm not, I don't think, I honestly don't feel that the striping is going to be the answer. Okay. As everybody else had said, I think right. we have we have a bigger issue here, and that's why the last five years I have been dealing with the city just to get somebody to listen to me. Well, you're here now, we're listening. I appreciate and it very much. I understand that you I, have a problem. I, I came here once before, it. and I was told to shut up and sit down, and I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity tonight to say what I had to say. Thank well, you. we want a safe environment for everyone. So do we. So. And, and those kids down the street, they do play in the middle of the street. We have other kids. Um, like I say, it's coming out of the Cameron Center. My house is right there. I cannot... I can't walk across the street some days to go even visit my neighbor without these people... They'll, they'll run you over, or they'll go around you, but they won't slow down coming in and out. And I live the closest to it. If you'd like to come and sit in my backyard one afternoon, come on over. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. the offer. All right. Thank you. Um, and we did not receive any uh, statement cards. Do the commissioners have any questions of staff? Commissioner? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Based on the input that I'm hearing on this, I'm thinking that we need to find some other solutions possibly for this area. Um, I realize what motivated this, and I think it could be a solution, but uh, I'm hearing a number of problems on this street uh, due to the increased usage of Cameron Center, which we don't control. That's a different issue. I guess, number one, I would like to uh, ask that we notify whoever runs that center, you know, of, uh, of a traffic issue, if it's possible to make them a little more aware there. I don't know if we have any control over the driveway or the exit point there that we could create some signage, you know, slow down residential. Um, I did hear and I did observe today, uh, since that bike path is right next to the uh, entrance and, and more importantly the exit right there uh, the Cameron Center that if people are coming down that bike uh, path with any kind of speed they're not going to be able to stop if there's a car conflict I'm actually kind of shocked if there is a lot of traffic there that that we haven't had an accident or maybe we haven't had a reported one 
Um, my first request would be that we look at possibly our new green lane marking, designating, you know, maybe uh, bike arrow, you know, bike bike um, paths, uh, maybe sharrows for that street uh, so people become aware that they have to share it with the bikes. Um, I don't know what we can do if there is a stop sign at the end of that camera and people Excuse are blowing me. by it, then I guess I would ask uh, Sergeant Clifton if maybe he can give us some assistance so far as enforcement. But I understand his problem is is he would need a schedule to know, you know, when people are actually leaving. They can't sit out there all day long waiting for one speeder. So, but if there's anything that they can do, even if it's our radar sign maybe, and I don't know if Excuse anybody has tried that. This is actually the time for questions for staff. And then we have another time where we'll yeah. take suggestions. Right. Okay. Those um, are my questions, if we could do any of these. Okay. Did you have questions? Would it be possible to develop some sort of slide deck or public service announcement that's geared towards the overall issue within Thousand Oaks and our traffic commission um, trying to shape more of a culture of safety, more of a culture of mindful driving that we could use to reach the parents in some of these problematic areas along, you know, all the school communities um, along Lynn, Lynn Road and um, with the, the homeschool folks as well throughout the entire Canal Valley Unified School District. And um, leverage the social media presence that we have with um, you know the Lynn Road safety on Lynn Road group and some of the other PTA folks throughout our community it seems like a, a low cost and effective way to really bring awareness to the issue and that could be something that we could turn around pretty quickly and experiment um. Uh, would you um, respond to the staff's questions and any of the questions that were brought up by our speakers, please? Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the first question has to do with the uh, spreading awareness, uh, like a campaign, educational campaign, maybe th either through the city's website or social media. Um, I think that's something that we, we can look into and b bring a report back to the Traffic Commission as to what would be involved and um, what would be required. I think that's uh, beyond just uh, public works. We'd have to work with some of the other departments at the city uh, to figure out a, a game plan on how to get that going. So that's something that we can come back and uh, report back to the commission on. Um, some of the other comments that the, uh, uh, or questions or comments that the uh, residents brought up in terms of, um, uh, for example, speed. Uh, our radar survey shows that the 85th percentile speed on that street is about 37 miles per hour, um, which comparatively to other roads of that width, uh, other roads are typically 42 to 43 miles an hour, which is, so this street is about five miles an hour less. Uh, a 40-foot a wide residential street, the 85th percentile speed is typically about 34, 33 miles an hour. So this one, even though it's 64 feet curb to curb, much wider, the speed is, um, you know, about three, four miles an hour faster than a uh, skinnier residential street. Um, yeah, the issue of the, uh, the the eyesore issue with the with the striping, yeah, that's one of the downsides for putting in this type of striping. Uh, the idea was with uh, the, the the concern that there's uh, vehicle traffic out there, bikes parked. Uh, cars that are parked along the street is to take the 64 feet curb to curb section and, and sort of better organize the use of the uh, what you have out there was just a center line and then at the uh, east end of the street there is no markings at all so uh, that's the idea with this type of striping so um, you know, we've had success with it on other streets uh, perhaps this is the type of road that um, you know maybe it's not applicable uh, we are also looking for neighborhood support before we do something like this for this type of road because it is uh, fronted by uh, residential homes. So uh, that's something to take into consideration. And I think that's pretty much it. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Gregory, would you like to start our <laughs> conversation? <laughs> that I did get ahead of myself, thank you for... All right, so uh, if we weren't to pursue uh, the striping plan, uh, I would request that uh, staff maybe come up with other suggestions uh, to deal with uh, traffic, traffic and speed calming, exiting Cameron, also conflicts with bicycles on that street coming down the pathways. I, I notice right now it has no bicycle markings whatsoever, but you know, Shero's always, I, I find, uh, help motorists realize they've got to share the road. Um, then also, I don't know, uh, when it comes to enforcement, that's always a temporary measure. <laughs> so it might have an effect for a very short while, um, and I don't know, you know, what the city's, and I'll defer that to Sergeant Clifton if he wants to make comment on that. I know it's always a challenge, <laughs> um, and that's about it. But thank you. Um, I, I'll just make a comment on the bicycle riding. I'm a cautious bike rider. I don't go zooming down the way maybe you see some of the others who are really into speed. But there are these posts at the bottom of the hill. And so you're looking up when you're at the top of the hill. You're looking up to see where the posts are. And you get a good view of the cul-de-sac. And you can see the cars coming up who might be turning left into the Cameron Center. You may not see the ones who are coming out. But those are, are going to probably be turning to the side. And if you, when you get near the bottom, at least for me, I'm going slow enough to get through those bars that I can see if there's somebody in a vehicle coming to my right. Um, in every group, there's always going to be outliers. People go too fast who drive dangerously in a car or in a bike. But I think many cyclists who use it are more like me, where they're conscious. And they can see from on top of the hill. I don't know. Um, one thing, and I, I, I should have done this at the uh, question time, but it, it occurs to me that most of the problem are people coming out of the Cameron Center and turning right. Is there some way we can make it hard for them to go fast? I, I know you can't use like dots, bots, or whatever they call them, or something to make it that it's just not possible to to, to accelerate fast. And and I guess that's what I have right now. Okay, yeah, that's so something we can look at. Um, I know, you know, with our speed hump policy, um, speed humps or uh, speed, speed cushions, those are reserved strictly for residential streets that are 40 feet curb to curb. So, um, yeah, maybe there is some alternative um, measure that we can look into, maybe a, a, a lower level uh, degree of, of road striping not to the degree that that would be the traffic calming striping but just just isolated striping there to uh, direct and channel the traffic so that maybe they're a little bit they feel a little bit more restricted rather than uh, seeing a 64 foot wide street so that they don't feel the the freedom to drive fast thank you commissioner I want to direct this uh, to sergeant Clifton Sometimes I see police cars parked with no officer, and I assume these are high mileage vehicles that aren't used. <laughs> now, Francesca mentioned that Mondays were the problem days, I believe. Is it possible just to park a patrol car there and not have anyone in it so that, you know, we're not getting charged uh, for the officer's time? We could do that. I, I think what you're seeing is officers on calls that are in buildings or homes. Well, actually, where I... Gen generally speaking, we don't park police cars on the street and, and leave them for, you know, enforcement. But we could do something like that. It's a good idea. I, <laughs> actually, what I see are um, L.A. Sheriff park their cars in parking lots uh, in malls where there's uh, banking. And they just sit there all day. 
our motor pool would feel about putting cars out that wouldn't be available for officers, but I'm quite sure we could do something like that. I, I will say that the police department received some complaints about this exact location uh, in December. And got out there in January and February, three different times. Generally speaking, it's during commute time. back into the neighborhood and we were able to sit there probably three 30 minute sessions for the afternoon commute back into the neighborhood and we didn't make any contacts. I was aware of the Cameron Center more often, but I don't have a schedule of it and it seems kind of sporadic. Got your Saturday and your Monday uh, time. I didn't get your Tuesday times. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can we um can we allow her to go back up? Is that allowed to to the microphone? I don't, I don't know the. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Go to the, and restate your name and city of residence, please. Francesca Puccio, two eighty two Yellowstone Avenue, Thousand Oaks. I'm right by the Cameron Center, right by the entrance. They speed going in. They speed going out. They speed down the private street that set, that's marked 10 miles per hour. They don't care about the neighborhood. They don't care about us walking our dogs, walking our kids. I walk there a lot. Not right now, but I, I normally do. Mondays, Monday through, fri Monday through Friday during the summer for three months. Fourth of July, if you'd really like to see how fun it is. And then the other day is Saturday from about 3 in the afternoon till 7 o'clock at night. There are other days, but those are the heaviest traveled days and the most speeding that takes place. The religious group, which is a whole other issue because I don't know that that's zoned for a religious group or if it's even zoned for a school. And my understanding is that if it is zoned for a school, that the speed limit should be 25 on the street, but it's not. So those are the days that it's really bad. It's not so bad later in the day until they come and pick their kids up. And that's around 3 or 4. You know, between 11 and 1, it's not too bad. But the rest of the time when the moms are, uh, believe me, I've stood out there with Linda quite a few times just as an experiment to see how, how fast they were going. And if they're doing 37 in a 30-mile, I understand they can't get a ticket because they have to be going at least 43. I get that. But it's a residential neighborhood, even though it's a wide street. We're residents. We're human beings. We live there. We would like to see something done. I mean, my ultimate goal would be to get the Cameron Center closed, but I, I understand that can't, that's not going to happen right now. So if we can do something to get these thousands of people that go in, in and out of there all the time to, to slow down and respect us, I know everybody that's here would appreciate it, and the people that aren't here would appreciate it. As I said before, there are neighbors, there's a 75-year-old neighbor across the street from me who almost got hit by a bicyclist while she was pulling her car out of her driveway. I have another young couple that pulled their car out of the driveway, and they're okay. concerned about getting hit. Um, I, so I, I, I understand. I just want to make question. sure, because you're making comments here that you don't see that there's an issue. There really is. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank just you. Just want to answer your question. Okay. Um, let's see. Do we have further discussion at this point? Do we have a motion at this point? Commissioner? Yeah, I guess I could say something. Um, based on the conflicting information that I have here about the striping, and these are all coming from the people that live there, they don't seem to think that that's going to solve the problem. Um, I would like to challenge staff to come up with maybe some other proposals that we could maybe implement. Um, they may, however, be Band-Aids because we only have so many tools. Uh, the striping proposal has worked in other areas, so, you know, we're not here to force it on you. We're here to use it as a valuable tool that has worked other places. Um, I would suggest that possibly we find other solutions for this area and see if it does a calming method. Uh, I would also suggest that we contact whoever's in charge of the camera and try to ask them to do an education 
process. So they're the ones that have now brought more traffic onto that street, and you know, it it's somebody's center. I'm sure it needs to be utilized. It was always there. If it wasn't being utilized before, that was your advantage. It is now, uh, and we don't control that. But they should educate that they have changed the traffic pattern significantly, significantly, and they need to educate the people that are using it. You know that they need to respect the local laws and i don't know what we can do to do that um and then i would ask you have we covered enough alternative things you know so far as the striping and all that uh to uh um to to give you direction <laughs> as to right now i cannot support the recommendation of the striping so i would i wouldn't support you know ordering that but that if you can come back and look at alternatives and maybe present them on another date, you know, that would be what I am proposing. Would you like to make a motion that uh, we ask staff to um, look at other uh, yeah, alternatives? Yeah, I'll make it simple. Yeah, I, I'm going to make the proposal that we do not proceed with the uh, uh, striping recommendation at this time. Uh, possibly for future date if needed, but currently to come up with alternate alternate methods to uh, alleviate both the speeding and any kind of traffic conflicts on that street. I second the motion. Okay. Um, uh, Mrs. Zambrano, do you think we can take a hand vote on this? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We really value your input. We really, really value your input. And um, the questions we ask are sometimes devil's advocate, and sometimes they're serious questions, which we just we don't know because we don't live there. And driving there or riding there, you only see a portion of it. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And. Um, we, we are we are done right now with this. Um, you can talk to Mr. Mashiko um, after the meeting or at any time you can call his office. And okay, so now we are on um, engineering report 7B. Um, Mr. Hauser. Madam Chair, members of the commission, good evening. Uh, my purpose here tonight is to provide the commission with a brief overview of the city's progress towards the development of its transit master plan, as well as to provide you some of the uh, recommendations that we know are uh, major recommendations that are coming out of the plan. Back in 2013, the city staff uh, did a, uh, made an application for a competitive grant for federal transit planning purposes with the idea of developing a long-range master plan for our transit program. Uh, even though the city has been providing transit uh, to its residents for over 40 years, we've never really looked at a comprehensive plan for this. And this really came about uh, in part uh, because of the city's visioning process, which many residents and I think even the members of the commission participated in. And we got a lot of really good feedback from residents on what, did they, what they wanted to see in transit long term. Uh, we were uh, awarded a grant in uh, 2014 and in 2015 a, we, with the assistance of the Southern California Area uh, Agency of Governments. We were able to um, get this process rolling, which began in earnest in June. The project overview is to, again, uh, provide a short and long-term uh, visioning for transit and provide specific recommendations on those things that the city should be considering. And also, um, and I think most importantly, uh, evaluating our role in a more regional approach to providing a transportation. The goals of the uh, project were to develop uh, a vision, goals, uh, policies, and implementation plan, uh, to conduct a review of our existing services and a needs study, uh, to generate then options for uh, consideration as part of the presentation to City Council for their consideration. 
This was a multi-prong approach. Um, the consultant that was hired uh, did an extensive evaluation of our existing services, and I am pleased to tell the commission that um, the residents overall are, are fairly happy with the service and the quality of service we provide. Uh, where we seem to shine relative to our peers is in our dial -a ride service. Where we have some struggles and need for improvement is in our fixed route or local bus service. They did an extensive demographic analysis. Um, they also took a look at uh, the council's own goals for both the city and transit and as well as those elements that came out of the visioning uh, process. And then we held extensive meetings with the public, a total of 15 public outreach sessions uh, between uh, December and April. And then right now the, uh, prepare, the, the draft report has been prepared and presented to, uh, to staff uh, this past week and after extensive review uh, and some final polishing we will present that to City Council probably in July for their consideration. Uh, from our public outreach show, there were some key takeaways uh, that from the feedback we received both from residents and also from social ser service organizations that there was a need for more frequent uh, bus service, that the existing bus routes were too cumbersome, too long, that we needed to increase the number of places where the buses did stop. We needed to expand our service offering to portions of the community that aren't currently being served, and importantly is also to expand our service hours. Uh, Council took a, a fairly bold step uh, several years ago as part of our uh, transit uh, study session. We've expanded the dollar ride hours twice. We've expanded bus service hours twice and added Saturday bus service. But the uh, consultant is recommending that there's still more that needs to be done. Uh, in particular, uh, we need to move away from the loop bus system that we're currently using now to a bus that's more bi-directional. In other words, the same bus goes up and down the same street in two different directions. We need to reduce our travel time. And by doing so, we should be able to increase the connectivity between our own routes as well as the regional services such as VCTC Inner City, Metro 161. And it's really important if we're going to get people, encourage people to use the bus service, we need to reduce the wait times. The consultant has recommended a three-phase approach to implementation of the major plans, and while I'm my presentation tonight is going to focus mainly on the bus service, there are a number of recommendations also for dial ride and other aspects of our service. The existing gold route, which services Newberry Park and the, uh, the Oaks Shopping Center, would be a split into two routes. The current green route, which services Los Robles, CLU, and the teen center and library complexes, would be simplified and shortened. Route 3 would be the primary uh, service along Thousand Oaks Boulevard. Route 4 would be the primary service along Hillcrest Drive. And we would uh, expand our Metrolink shuttle service, which currently takes people to and from Thousand Oaks to the Metrolink station in Moore Park, and expand that to include the Newberry Park industrial area, which would include uh, uh, major employers such as Baxter, Amgen. Um, and I apologize to the, for the residents at home that may be watching. These are going to be somewhat difficult uh, to, to view. Uh, however, I will present a, a web address at the end of this presentation where you can go and peruse the slides. Uh, this gives an indication here of the, uh, the proposed uh, six route st structure. And as you can see, uh, or the, the routes as they're designed cover all the major uh, residential and employment points uh, in the city. In addition to the uh, bus improvements, uh, there's also a recommendation to um, develop a more robust application uh, reservation process for the dial ride that would include uh, online uh, reservation, something that we don't do right now. Continue to expand on the city's uh, well-received travel training program where we actually provide uh, both a sort of a classroom tutorial on how to use bus service and then take people out on demonstration bus rides so they can see for themselves. And of course, as we expand our bus service, we're going to have to procure more vehicles. And a bus takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months from the time that we decide that we want to buy one until the time we actually take delivery of it. And lastly, the, a more formal process in terms of deciding where we place bus stops and what types of amenities we put. 
For the second phase, we would extend the service, our existing bus service, into Agoura Hills. This would be a new route that would cross the entire community, would start, originate in Newberry Park, go all the way across the community to Agoura Hills, so there would be no need to transfer if you wanted to get across town. We'd also increase service along Thousand Oaks Boulevard and would uh, establish service along Moore Park Boulevard uh, to CLU. The map there shows the uh, two uh, additional routes. The light blue would be the, the, the east to west route, and the dark blue would be the north to south route. Also as part of the phase two recommendations, uh, there is a, currently a countywide volunteer driver mileage reimbursement program. We would seek to expand uh, on that pro program to make more opportunities for Thousand Oaks residents to utilize it. Recommendations to expand our weekday service uh, to as which is currently 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. to 4:30 a.m. to 9:30 p.m. and to extend weekend service to 9:30 p.m. as well. We'd also try to implement and on a demonstration uh, basis, probably somewhere between uh, 90 days and six months, or perhaps even a year, a uh, Sunday bus service, and also to look at ways that we can provide like bus service to areas of the community that because of their design, the roadways are were not really appropriate to put in a full-size transit bus, but there may be ways that we can use smaller vehicles to be a feeder service. And also, uh, again, an incremental uh, increase in the installation of bus stop amenities. And lastly, Phase 3 would introduce a new local connecting bus service to Simi Valley, probably in the area of Wood Ranch that would connect to the Simi Valley uh, Route D to allow local service uh, between our two communities. This is important as we, again, look at a regional approach and as our participation in the East County Transit Alliance. And also to increase service along uh, Route 2, um, make that service bidirectional. I would say that of all the recommendations that I as a staff person have seen so far, this is the one where I think is probably more appropriate maybe in Phase 1 or Phase 2 but that will be something for the consultant and the council uh, to consider. This would be uh, the new route, which would, it's Route 8, which would be our ninth route that would take folks uh, into Simi Valley. There has been some discussion on the, uh, based upon the feedback that we have received from residents, and I'm going to take advantage of the mouse here, that rather than go up Moore Park Boulevard, we might consider doing the same route, but doing it perhaps up Herbs instead. Also, uh, with Phase 3, it would be improvements to the sidewalk and bicycle infrastructure between Thousand Oaks Boulevard and the Transportation Center, which is off of uh, Rancho Road. And I'm happy to say that the city has already secured the grant funding for that. That is part of our capital improvement project, and I hope that we would probably have that project completed before the end of fiscal year 17-18. And lastly, um, a, because it is the single most popular stop uh, in our system and has the most buses, would be to... Uh, uh, establish a formal uh, transfer facility at the Oaks Mall Shopping Center. Uh, I have reached out uh, to their staff to make them aware that this is going to be one of the recommendations. Uh, as you can imagine, though, that type of real estate and the use of that property is extremely value, valuable, plus the city does have very stringent parking requirements, so that will be a, a, a long-term uh, discussion. So that completes my formal uh, presentation. Um, the We have established a website that is project-specific for that. It's a www.totransitmasterplan.com where you can find uh, information as well as the, the maps that I referenced. Uh, fairly soon here, with I hope within the next week or two, we'll, we will actually put up a copy of the draft plan so that you, the folks at home who want to take the time, can peruse uh, all 240 pages, uh, lots of nice charts and, and graphs and, and such. And then uh, we also encourage people uh, to visit our own transit we website, which is a wealth of information, and that's www.totransit.org. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Are there any questions? Commissioner? Thank you. Does the consultant uh, make any recommendation as to what type of equipment the city should use? Uh, will all the buses be the same size for various routes? 
Um, and I do have to apologize. I just recently myself got the copy, and so I have not been through the entire presentation as yet. But I would tell you that um, as a as matter of policy, we have been reducing the size of our buses over the years. We were 40-foot buses, 35, and now our most, uh, for, uh, most recent purchase was 30-foot. Uh, however, um, we do have some routes where we reach the legal limit of capacity of those buses, particularly uh, routes that are high schools in the afternoon and stuff. So we do have to, it's a careful balance of not going too small. Um, it has been the policy of this community that uh, the alternative fuel for our transit vehicles, we were one of the first communities in the entire nation to have 100% of its bus fleet on an alternative fuel, which in this case is CNG. And I hope to be able to tell uh, the council and commissions and the folks at home that we will probably, if not the first, we will be one of the first uh, agencies in this county to operate electric buses as part of our regular service. So in terms of a specific recommendation, um, I don't think they're going to get quite to that detail, but what they will do is make a recommendation plans to, to make sure that we have a consistent policy for replacement and a financial plan so that as we add routes, we will have the financial wherewithal to be able to, to fund those bus purchases. Thank you. Commissioner? Yeah, this is uh, simply for my uh, information only but I see uh, that they're proposing going from the loop model to a bi-directional model does that require that people need to you know for example take a north-south bus route and get off and then go east-west no not necessarily um, and I'll, I'll use the a green route as an example right now let's say if you if you want to board the green route at the Oaks and you want to get to the teen center because we only travel in one direction, it takes you almost 80 minutes to get to the teen center. But to get from the teen center back to the Oaks Mall only takes about 25 minutes because of the path of travel. Now you'll be able to take a bus that's going in both directions, so you'll be able to take the shortest segment to get to your to the teen center, or in this case, you could take the the 25 minute because you know the bus is going to go in in both directions. So that's really the kind of the the, the impetus behind that. Certainly, over in the um, areas of Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Hillcrest, depending on which direction you want to travel, you're either going to take one bus or the other bus, and so you have to know both bus lines and you have to know where each one stops. Rather than a single bus line that you know is gonna stop on both sides of the street, you only have to know that one bus line. That's great. Actually, I've seen that work. I think they use that in the San Fernando Valley and all that. And I actually ran across an app that feeds into Google Maps that all you have to do is put where you want to go and it comes up with the bus routes and all kinds of stuff. An, an excellent observation and we do actually have that service all both on our website plus all of our buses are tracked in real time and through a um, program called NextBus. Anybody can on their phone look up where the nearest bus stop is, uh, what bus to stop there, and the predicted arrival times for each one of those depending on what direction you want to travel. Great. Thank you. That was a great question uh, because I do not understand the bi-directional and thought I did, <laughs> and now I do. The hardest part for us is just simply finding the appropriate place to turn the bus around mm -hmm. to get it going back in the other direction. Mm -hmm. How many buses do you anticipate purchasing? Over the course of this three-phase program, which the consultant is going to recommend, is going to take between 18 months and five years. We'll probably have to add another 9 to 11 buses to our total fleet of 11 buses right now. And are there grants out there to purchase them? Uh, there are grants to purchase. We are very proactive in terms of seeking out the funding. I can tell you that right now that the funding's already secured for the first five buses. Oh, that's, I, that's awesome. We plan for a, a, a bus is a 12 to 15 year commitment for the city. And so I, we began the process to replace the buses that we're going to have to replace in 2020. We began that process in 2013. That's awesome. And um, I was really excited to see certain of our city's parking lots getting the solar panel covers for these electric buses that you anticipate getting. Will you be um, trying to charge them the solar panel somehow? Is, is that on your list at all? 
Commissioners, you ask really great questions. Yes, it is actually on his list. Um, for those of you that, uh, I don't know if you've ever vi visited our municipal service center or our yard where we keep all of our equipment. That's where all the buses and all the dial ride vehicles are, are parked. We recently did an upgrade in 2014 to install new, new fueling and parking for that. Uh, at the time, we didn't have enough available funding to put up a canopy with solar, but I'm happy to report that is also a project that is actually in funded and in the works, and I hope by this time, maybe next year, maybe a little bit later, that we'll actually have that so that when we do get the electrical buses in, we may not be able to directly um, power and charge the buses with the solar. It's a it's a very it these these are 480 uh, 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 volt, very high amperage, more than what can be generated. But what we can do is we can sell out the electricity to the utility, and then charge at night at a lower rate. And so it is in essence paying to do that. And so that is part of the plan. Additionally, we. As soon as the vehicles become available, we'll begin to transition our dial ride fleet to electric vehicles as well, and we have plans to install charging stations. I'm also happy to report that the transit program uh, just recently purchased the city's first city-owned EV vehicle. We took delivery of that last week. So it's part of an ongoing process and commitment to be as environmentally responsible in our transit program as we can. That is awesome. I'm so excited to hear that. One last question, and then I'll send it to you. Um, the route that you're anticipating to go to CME, have you approached CME to participate as far as financially or anything like that? Uh, both of our cities are part of the East County Transit Alliance, and yes, we, we've already had those discussions. Now, in terms of uh, financial participation, uh, I'm not sure that that would be necessary or required. Uh, it's literally it's where we would transfer is almost at our, our collect or at our respective city limits, um, where we might want to seek some participation and certainly something for uh, future discussion is the bus route that goes between Newbury Park and Agoura Hills. Uh, uh, L.A. County has several measures uh, that, uh, as part of their sales tax, that help pay for transit, and there would be the hope that if we're providing some bus service that they don't have to pay for, that they might uh, want to come in with us to, to make it as a robust a service as possible. Thank you very much. It sounds like you've thought of pretty much everything. It's exciting. Commissioner, did you have any questions? No, nope, just thank you. I attended one of the public outreach sessions, so... Um, it looks like you guys came up with a great strategy here and a lot of sensible modifications. Okay, uh, at that time we do have a speaker, and I apologize you had to wait so long. Um, Chase Rashid, please uh, state your name and city of residence. Chair and uh, members of the Traffic Commission, uh, Chase Rashid, City of Thousand Oaks. Okay, so I was very pleased with this plan. I'm a member of the uh, Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee for Ventura County. I represent the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, when I saw the, uh, the maps at the uh, public outreach session, I was like, yes, this is exactly what we need. I think it would increase ridership. We have uh, some of the lowest ridership in the state for a city our size. Um, Fairbanks North Star Alaska actually has a better rideship, ridership than we do, so I think we can do a lot better than uh, Fairbanks Alaska. Um, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama actually has similar ridership and they only ri uh, run a trolley. But um, I also want to say that the city won the Cal Act Award for coordination. So that was out there on Twitter, but I just wanted to mention it here. And I really want to commend the, uh, the whole plan because it's hard to get a um, effective bus routes out of a city with a layout like this. I was raised in Santa Barbara. We had effective public transit, but our city boundaries, it's very slender the way it's laid out. Thousand Oaks kind of goes, it expands out. So it was difficult. The number two, that was the most difficult one, but it seems like the uh, department has really got that together. And um, I was very pleased with the plan. Um, when I first moved here, my family first moved here, there were only three bus routes. It was very hard to get anywhere. Um, 
public transit if I want to put my age out there I'll say when my I had family that moved out here um uh, I'm not gonna say my age because it's been officially deleted by authority of the governor so I'm not gonna do that <laughs> but um when I'm first when they might have family that I first moved here I remember when the buses were like not even really buses they were just like little shuttles so so we've come a long way and this is a great step in the right direction and I do think that it's going to increase ridership I know a lot of people who have actually run interference for you know coming into these meetings uh communicating their needs and you know some of my needs too because I use public transit a lot so I just really want to thank uh everybody involved in this process and it's a great step in the right direction thank you thank you do we have any questions all right thank you very much um i guess we're on to item number eight uh status report of prior traffic commission recommendations <clears throat> are there any questions or comments on that or did you have something mr mashika on that uh just uh point out there's uh, just the two items that are there first one has to do with the green bike lanes that the Commission uh, reviewed um, uh, late last year and uh, we're in the process of ordering materials to put in the uh, green bike lane markings at five locations um, it's probably going to be about 60 days before it's actually implemented in the field there's about a 20 to 30 day window for the material to arrive and then we'll have to schedule it with our uh, street maintenance crew to to put those in uh, second item is um, before the meeting I passed out a little handout on the flashing yellow arrows it's uh, basically uh, brief information on what they are and how they work mm -hmm. with uh, more information provided at our city website which is live on this uh, information it's www.toaks.org uh, backslash flashing yellow arrow so if you want to take a look at the website uh, feel free and um, which means we're about 30 days from um, implementing or turning on the flashing yellow arrows at our first three locations in the city. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner referrals from February 17th, there are none. Um, item number 10, work program and commission schedule. Um, are there any questions of staff? Any comments or discussion? Okay. In that case, the Tra Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission is now adjourned until 6.30 p.m. on May 18th, 2016 in the boardroom of the Civic Arts Plaza on the third floor. Good night.